So happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, we are noon and it is straight up on July 26th. And today's discussion is about the shifting market. So I, I've had a couple of people actually with today's reminder say that what a great topic because I hope that if we're active, we've been seeing what's going on with it. So I happen to take and uh, I put together a few thoughts here. There is yeah, the greatness of yellow when you're doing the screen like this. Uh, but I asked Alex also to just throw together a few of his thoughts around what he's been hearing, what he's been learning, what he's been coaching out there with his coaching clients. So that's what we're going to go through today. Uh, and I, I just want to start out with a quick where we were. So I'm going to do a, a screen share here. And I don't know if you guys have thought about this or not. Where is my T, 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 T? I've got to probably go here. Which will allow me to go to, okay, go away. Got a shift here. Pardon me for just a moment as I pull up this. So this is what I wanted you to be able to actually see. Um, don't know if you you've thought about it, but we're we're talking about a shifting market. Part of that is 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 it going to crash? So the answer to that is no. We're we're not going to have a crash. We're not going to see that. And here's what I want you to see. And we're looking at this, uh, by the way, uh, homes for sale. This is inventory, inventory of homes. This goes back to 2006. Here's what we know. When did it all peak? Right there, 2008. That's when our inventory was at the highest because all of the foreclosures, double digit foreclosure. If a home was selling, 90% uh, of them were what we referred to as distressed properties. Distressed properties, meaning for one reason or another, they actually had issues. We're entering foreclosure, we're in foreclosure, did foreclose, it was short sales, it was a distressed property. So if you go back to that time, what's the number there? 151,000 homes were on the market within the real comp MLS. Now let's drag that down over the timeline. And as you can see from that bar, it did nothing and has done nothing, but continue to drop until where we are today, right now, as of the moment, 16,982 homes for sale. So we went down to that from that 100 and what is it? 161 was the high. So guys, this was an abnormally high number of listings on the market, not to mention the number of people that fell out of the market because they couldn't get financed. We have to return to a normal market before we'll ever see a crash. But I just want you to compare those differences from the high to where we are now. Along with that, let's take a look at the number of new listings. Again, just look at the number of homes that came on the market, 391,000. Look where we are today. 160, by the way, pardon my, my eyes are not looking that great, 161,000. So there's quite a drop that we're seeing. So we've got to bring things into what we would call a balance. We have to return to a normal market. And yet, here's another key indicator as to the market itself. The month supply of inventory. And again, we're looking at a 10-year history. So here's at the height of it, 17.7 .7 month 
supply of inventory. Otherwise, if no other homes came on the market, it would take almost 18 months to sell every house at the rate that it was selling at at the time. And of course, you can see the timeline and it's dropping, 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 dropping until we get to what we might call an area where it's a normal market, where we had about a four to five month supply of inventory, neither a buyer's market nor a seller's market. It's a normal market. And of course that didn't last long because the inventory, even through that time period, continued to drop, but more importantly, the number of sales hit, which affects this month's supply of inventory. But guys, look where we are. So we're one and a half months supply of inventory. No other homes come on the market. It would take only six weeks and every other, every home in the market would sell. We're far from a crash, is what I'm trying to give to you. And people need to understand this, and you need to understand it to describe it to people so that they would understand why we're not going to crash. Now, there's lots of other economic differences that we could look at, but I wanted to show you this just so you would be able to understand why we're not going to experience a crash in the market but rather a great term is that we are beginning to see a shift. Now, one of the emails that I got that was just a, hey, great topic that you're delivering, Darwin, came from Mary Sumter out of our Owasso office. She, she said this to me, and this is just her observation. Uh, great topic, Darwin, because within the last two and a half weeks, the market is changing. Appraiser, appraisers are even more particular with their values and taking longer for showings and offers to come in. Sellers are having a hard time understanding this, but it is so important that we explain this to every one of our sellers. So here's Mary, one of our top producers in the blue and has been in, uh, gosh, I don't know, Mary's been in the business for longer than me and I'm 35 years. And this is an observation that Mary's seeing out there in uh, actually Morris office, I, I said Owasso. Um, but she's already, I'm gonna say, feeling it because the numbers that we're looking at, they're really not showing what we're talking about. So that's a key thing. So is it going to crash? I'm not an economist, but it's hard for prices to be projected to increase by five, six, seven, eight percent, go back to a previous one in regards to the market, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to see more of the number. You don't have to hide like that as you walk in. You can't even be quiet either. So I had to pick on somebody as they're coming in right now. Uh, go back to that video regarding the market update with what the numbers are. That will also help you address and speak with people during this market. Now, uh, hopefully what you're seeing is my PowerPoint presentation. And again, I've got to move things around so I can show you this. Just to let me do the slideshow. Got a full view of it there, guys, a thumbs up. So what you should see is what causes a home to sell. I still have the this. last one up there. Uh, Darwin, we still have the uh, months on uh, houses on market still. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Let me do now, we'll go back, boom. How about now? Awesome. So what is it that causes <clears throat> a home to sell? I want you to make note of this. And, and Gold Group, sorry, I had to pick one or the other because I realized I didn't have a generic one here. So um, four components to a successful sale. 
what are the four components? So if you just think of the uh, uh, presentation to a seller, it is this. It's the market, it's the promotion, property, and price. So let's think of this, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. Address the market first. Can you, I, or anyone do anything about the market? And the answer is no, it is what it is. The remaining three components is what we control and that's what we need to adjust to is to the market. You might even use the term that the old market. We're in a new market. The old market was, the new market is, and we have no control over it. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But we need to adjust the remaining three. Now, the first one is what you hire me to do, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, and that is to give you full and complete exposure. Promote your property so that if anybody finds it or needs to find a home like yours, they're going to be able to find it. Now, there's only two markets that I'm going to promote the property to because there's only two markets. One of the markets is the general public. Now, that's what I often will refer to as the prospects and the suspects. Now, those are important because suspects become prospects, prospects become buyers. We want to capture them so that when we do put your home on the market, there's a good possibility we're going to have a buyer for your home. However, the primary market really is the realtor community because if I'm right, you don't want prospects or suspects walking through your home. Rather, you're looking for buyers. 85% of the people who bought a home, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, worked through a realtor. They found their home, bought the home using a realtor. So really what we're going to do is to make sure we give you the fullest exposure to those individuals we want to reach to the buyers. Now, that leaves us simply with this. The property and price, and Mr. and Mrs. Seller, the key is that we put these two things in balance. If we do this the wrong way, the home will not sell. If we do it the right way, your property will sell and we'll have it sold in less than 30 days. Now, that statement works regardless of the market because when I was showing you 2008, I was selling homes in less than 30 days when the prices were doing this at 1.5% per month. It's understanding the four factors. So as you go through, I want you to know that part of it. Please, please, please remember the four components. It is a setup for being able to get properties properly priced by being able to set a competitive, realistic asking price. So what I want to introduce then with that is how do I get started into it? I'm going to share some verbiage and then Alex, I'm going to ask you to jump in with one of, one of them that you've got here. But one of them that I think we need to start talking about is the new market versus the old market. The old market was really simple. The old market was put a home on the market. It didn't matter what you actually listed it for. Didn't really matter much of who you actually employed. Didn't matter what you priced it at because you would end up with multiple offers, people tripping over themselves to be able to get into your house. They would pay you whatever you wanted. And matter of fact, they'd even pay part of your closing costs and let you stay there for 60 days at no cost. Oh, by the way, is there anything else that we could do? We're in a new market now. And with that, what it means is we're returning to normalcy where your price may not be met or exceeded, where we may have to actually negotiate to get the highest possible price, where we may have to negotiate how long you receive after the closing, where you have to actually deal with paying all of your own closing costs. It's a new market. The old market is in the past. So I, I think that's just something. If you, if you hold on to those two terms, old market, new market, it will give you the opportunity to speak realistically and most importantly, to be able to get them setting a competitive 
realistic asking price. Alex, what would you throw to us? Yeah, um, kind of build on that. You know, in any shifting market, uh, a talented real estate agent's value increases, right? I mean, six to 12, 18 months ago, any Joe Smith off the street could take a listing, throw a sign in the yard, price it relatively close, and it's going to sell, right? But in the time of a shifting market, agents' value increases, meaning the most talented, skilled agents are going to win the most business, and the ones that don't dedicate time to generate skill and development are going to fall to the wayside. You have to have value, right? That means pricing property, and same on the flip side for the buyer. Buyer is no longer trying to just get their offer accepted by offering $20,000 over asking and paying closing costs. Now they are looking to find the best value, meaning that they're going to offer less than asking. They may ask for concessions, and that's what's going to happen in a shifting market. So as a listing and sell, uh, buyer's agent, it's non-negotiable. You have to work on your presentation skills, and you have to work on your sales skills, okay? Because if you don't, there will be agents out there that will be more skilled, more developed, and buyers and sellers will choose them over you because now they need to. In a shifting market, they don't have the luxury of just hiring a friend or hiring someone in the business just because they know them. They want to hire someone who's going to get them the best sale on the home or the best deal on the purchase, okay? So presentation skill is important. And piggybacking off of that, now is the time to set expectations for price reductions when you're listing property, okay? So for those of you who've been in the business for a couple of years, you may not even know what a price reduction is because you didn't need to do it. But now when you're meeting with the seller and you're talking about the new market that we're in, we need to help them understand that, look, if we're not sold within 30 to 45 days, that is the market telling us that we're out of balance. Like Darwin said, we have to be in balance, right? Not that we're priced too high or that your home isn't worth that what you want it to be because that's what a seller loves to hear, right? The, the, we're just out of balance, right? So we got to make a correction. And the longer you wait to make that correction in a shifting market, the more leverage you sacrifice to the buyer, meaning you are essentially giving that buyer more negotiation power against you because now you have days on market, okay? So setting the expectations, if we're not sold within the first three weeks on the market, we need to have a conversation about maybe making an adjustment and that's going to re you know, require a price adjustment, okay? The other thing you have to be religious with, it's again, again, it's non-negotiable in a shifting market. You have to have a rigorous follow-up system, okay? So if you talk to someone and they say, yeah, I'm thinking about selling, right? You have to stay on them, Okay. You can't just forget about them and call them once, and didn't answer, or have one conversation and not hear from them for four weeks. They will hire somebody else, okay? It's going to get much more competitive, which means you're going to have to fight for a lot more business. And at the same time, if you did two, three, four, five million last year, you're probably going to have to put forth twice the amount of effort that you did last year just to get the same results, okay? But that also presents an opportunity because, again, if you're an agent who dedicates time to skill development and skill building, you're going to separate yourself from the competition and you're going to allow yourself to go out and grab more market share, especially when you're competing with agents who may not be as skilled or developed. Okay. So you're, your value is going to increase. And even with that happening, sellers will be more likely to pay you 6% if they know that you are skilled, you are a negotiator, you know how to price property and you will get the deal closed because it's going to become much more difficult to get deals closed, okay? So those are kind of just things off the top of my head. Awesome. So how about we cover some key phrases or verbiage or, or dialogue? So I, I've already mentioned the four components. We've, you've heard Alex and I using the term shifting market. By the way, it won't take long and we will be able to say the market has shifted. Let's talk about the new market versus the old market. So those would be some key terms that I think that you'd want to uh, be able to throw out there. Um, here's an additional one right now for this time of the year. And this is one you could use throughout your career. Hot summer selling season. Hot summer selling season, write that one down. Hot summer selling season. 
And right now the term would be Mr. and Mrs. Seller, not only have we seen a shifting market and we need to address this new market that's coming, but we're also approaching the end of the hot summer selling season. That by itself will explain what it is. But I think if you've been in the business for a while, you know that we've got about the first two weeks of August and then boom, it's going to level off. And we're going to have to suffer because everybody's wrapping up vacation, getting kids ready to start school. There's all the extracurricular activities, if you will. School really doesn't start in September or the last week of August. Like right now, I, I just drove by uh, St. Mary's High School, and the guys were out on the football field already. So this is what happens when we come to August. So that's, that's one that's out there. Uh, let's see. I just wrote one down that I think it's really important. One is, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, can we have a fierce conversation today? Get permission. Get the permission to have fierce conversations. You know, the leadership team is using that all the time, that term. But we should be able to ask if we can have fierce conversation with them today as we talk. That gives you permission to be able to ask the appropriate questions that lead them in a good direction. The next one, I want you to think about this. We should now again remember that there are three pricing strategies. Make sure you talk with everybody about those. I know that you guys know what they are. And I'm just kidding about that. I wouldn't do that to you. Three pricing strategies. One, you got to have a pricing strategy for rising markets. How about the stable market or the falling market? There are three distinct pricing strategies. In a rising market, what do you do with the price? And it took people forever to figure this out. But people go, oh, no, the comp said. But yes, the market's rising. You can price a property higher. Why? Because the market will catch up. In a stable market, can you do the same thing? The answer is no. The price isn't going to catch up. Therefore, the house will sit on the market because the price stayed the same. What you need to do in a stable market is to bring that price in line with what it's actually worth. There's not going to be a whole lot of room for negotiation in a stable market. And of course, in a falling market, where do you have to put the price? Up here? Everybody shake their head negatively. We need to go below. You actually need to get ahead of the market. What's the reason for that? The market's going to catch up. Now, if, if you just think about what I just gave you, the words will come for you. Rising, stable, falling. Prices will catch up. Nope, we got to bring them closer together. We've got to get ahead of the market. Use the three terms. Help people understand so that they can set an appropriate price. Alex, you got any verbiage that you came up with? I put this guy on short notice today. Yeah, gave me like an hour notice, but it's all good. No, I would just say, you know, be conscious of that when you're going through your CMA, right? So even though the price is, because we like to go back six months for our CMA, because that's what the appraisers are going to look at, right? But just know that we're always six months behind. So just because we're looking at prices that were two, three, four, five months ago, and now it looks like you, you know, your home maybe worth 300,000. We gotta keep in mind, we have to keep ahead of the market, right? We don't wanna be chasing the market, right? And so now when the shifting market, we gotta keep that in mind to where, yeah, even though the past four or five months, your home may be at 300,000, we gotta position ourselves correctly because if we do overprice it, we immediately sacrifice leverage to the buyer, especially in this market that we're in, right? So if we overprice that home, not only are we taking a backseat to our competition of other homes that are on the market and that are going to come on the market, we're also giving negotiation power and swinging the power of favor to the buyer because like I said, we're gonna sit on the market, we're gonna to have to do price reductions and that's ultimately gonna kill momentum and give the buyer more leverage when it comes to negotiation price and terms. 
So let me throw a couple of additional things out here. You should remember this term, historically low inventory. Guys, all you gotta do is pull it from InfoSparks. It's in the MLS. Get the numbers, know them and understand them, how much we've actually fallen. Help people understand that we truly have historically low inventory. And look, you don't need a high school, more than a high school education to understand law of supply and demand. When the demand is there and the supply is low, you have rising prices. And that's what we've got right now. Um, still on the aspect of pricing, here's verbiage I want you to remember. You're talking with your sellers. You've had the home on the market for two weeks, 30 days. You do a review of the marketplace and you throw this out to them. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, now understanding that the market has spoken, other agents have spoken, and most importantly, the buyers have spoken, and they've rejected our asking price. What do you feel that we should do with your price to be able to get somebody to buy your home versus your competition? So it's three things. The market, other realtors, and most importantly, the buyers have spoken and they've rejected our asking price. What do you feel we should adjust it to to get somebody to buy your home versus the competition? I'll give it just one more time. It's those three things. The market, realtors, and most importantly, the buyers have rejected our asking price. Those dirty, mean, nasty individuals didn't verbiage like is important our asking price. Verbiage is important too when it comes to that because you don't want to say price reduction because obviously reduce is a negative connotation. So price improvement, price correction, price adjustment, right? Price improvement is typically my go-to because again, we're going to improve the price, we're going to improve the marketability, and now we're going to expose it to a brand new people who may have not seen it yet. Okay, so when you're having that conversation, try and use price improvement, price adjustment, price correction. Try and refrain from price reduction just because it has a negative connotation to it. Let's do a quick shift to buyers. How many think the interest rates are high? Don't show your hands. Interest rates are normal. Susie, these interest rates are normal. We have to understand, <laughs> here, I, for me, it's been 35 years in the business. And again, most of you heard me say that when I got in in 1987, interest rates bounced between 11 and 13. And if I got it down to nine, it's because I got a seller who paid points to get that interest rate down to 9%. Look, five or six is normal. Almost all of us can remember going, oh my gosh, they're down to five. Oh my gosh, it's four and a half. Oh my gosh, it's four. It's three and a half. It's three. We got below three. So these interest rates right now that we have are normal. And by the way, they really project that they're going to come back down again. So then the question is, is well, should I buy now? I actually like to throw this out. Why not buy now? Mr. Buyer, Miss Seller, or, or, or Miss Buyer, Mr. Buyer, why not uh, buy now? Why not? Well, the, I mean, the interest rates are really high. Are they? Or are they normal? I like to throw it back to this. How many people three years ago wish they would have bought three years ago? How much more are they paying in interest right now? Do you really believe that the market's going to crash and you've got all of that information we've talked about today and on a previous Hot Topic Tuesday? Guys, why not buy now? What's the worst thing that happens? Prices drop 3%, but what's it going to do in a normal market? And, and by the way, really? Is it going to drop with the inventory as low as it is with normal interest rates? I don't think so. 
So why not buy now? Oh, by the way, what if the interest rates drop? What do they do? Refinance. So if it drops to four, great. Why would you wait for it to drop? What if it doesn't? What if yeah. the market doesn't fall? And it's not. Last thoughts, Alex. Yeah, I just wanted to hit a key point that I've really been hearing on with my clients too is, guys, we need to be doing video, okay? I had a coaching client post a video last week in 24 hours. He had 500 views on it, okay? So if you're looking to get a hold of people and remind them of what it is that you're doing, post a video. And like Darwin's point, let's just say you, you close a deal with a buyer and you got a good deal and you got under asking. Guys, you have to post that, right? I got my buyer a great deal. I got $10,000 under asking and we got concessions or whatever that is. Post that, make that be known. And if you want a formula to what you should be doing on every post video, here's five key things you got to do. First thing is you want to start with a hook or a compelling headline. Okay. So for example, I'm sure you guys have been hearing now is not the best time to buy. Right. But let me share this with you. Right. Second thing you always want to do is introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Joseph White with Century 21. Third thing, you always want to support your hook with one to two facts, right? So, hey, I, you know, I heard, I'm sure you heard that now is not the best time to sell. My name is Alex with Cole Banker Real Estate. Did you know that even though interest rates are on the rise, they're still at historic lows? Not only that, but now is one of the best times to buy and then go into more details if you want. The fourth thing you want to do is have an example or testimonial. Here's these buyers, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that we just closed a deal on 123 Main Street, and they got $10,000 under asking. And the fifth and final thing you want to have is a call to action. So if this is something you may be interested in, please contact me at 123, blah, 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 blah. Right? Luna. Luna. Good stuff. Well, guys. I'm going to take one more minute, and I've already sinned, so I might just want to make it a big one. Uh, let me answer a couple of questions. What factors are used to calculate the month's supply of inventory? The uh, real simple math to it is this. Take the inventory divided by the number of homes that is sold during the current month. That's pretty much it. How many homes sold this month? Divide the inventory by that number and it will give you the month's month. supply of inventory. Um, Holly asked the question, are new builds in a slump too? Um, I have not seen or heard anything on the new builds slumping. I, I wouldn't foresee it unless if the builders get a little crazy because again, right now, low inventory is what we have there. And, and Valerie, ah. thank you. Sit. Valerie, thank you for that thought. I think this is great verbiage also. Uh, she's got it right here in the chat, chat room. But affordability is low. The affordability is low, not that the interest rates are high. So just additional verbiage that you might use. Uh, again, I think the biggest part is to let everybody know Yes, these are normal interest rates, but I do like that additional verbiage. So, guys, that's going to wrap it up for another Hot Topic Tuesday. Alex, thank you for jumping in with me, especially on short notice. I think it was actually 61 minutes that I gave you. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, guys, you know the thing to do. We just got to go talk to people, but let's go get that inventory and start prospecting and build that inventory up. Everybody have a great one. We will see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.